Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're tackling leukemia. So if you watched our lymphoma episode earlier this week, I'm going to give you the same disclaimer, which is we're not going into every single nuance and type and subset and treatment about and for leukemia. This pod is for new grad nurses and nurses preparing for their nursing school exams and the NCLEX. And to do that, you need to be a new nurse with two weeks of general nursing knowledge. You're not going to have your chemotherapy certification, or you're not going to have your oncology nurse certification as a new grad. You might work with clients that have cancer, but you won't be able to administer the chemotherapy yet. So today's episode is about the highlights, the prioritization, and the big ticket items you need to know in general about leukemia. So with that being said, let's kick it off as always with our practice question. The nurse is assessing vital signs for a client diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's ALL. The client's temperature is 101.6 Fahrenheit, which equals 38.7 Celsius. The nurse should prioritize which of the following. Should it be A, reviewing the client's most recent hemoglobin and hematocrit, B, performing a tepid sponge bath, C, initiating a peripheral vascular access device, or D, assessing the client for bruising. Now, think it through. What would you prioritize? Tuck that away. Maybe jot it down in your notebook, and we will circle back to the correct answer at the end. But first, let's start at the very beginning. What is leukemia? It's a blood cancer. It starts in the bone marrow, which of course is our factory that makes all of our blood cells. In a healthy person, that marrow keeps a balanced production line. Red blood cells carry oxygen, platelets help us clot, and white blood cells help us fight infection. In leukemia, however, we have something gone very awry with our blueprint. Instead of making mature functional cells, that bone marrow starts to pump out immature or abnormal white cells, and we call these blasts. So if you've ever worked with somebody who has cancer or know somebody and they say the cancer cells, they had this many cancer cells or the cancer cells were gone, those cells are the blasts, the immature abnormal white blood cells that that bone marrow ends up pumping out. And the thing is that these blasts have no idea how to do their job. They're immature. They're not fully baked. They shouldn't have come out of the oven yet, but they're still there which means they are taking up space, they are taking up resources, and crowding out all the healthy cells just by being there. Which is why clients with leukemia often have three big issues. First, because they don't have enough red blood cells, they become anemic, so fatigue, pallor, that's going to be really common. Second, too few platelets, those cells for clotting, which means they are at risk for bleeding. They will bruise very easily because they cannot clot efficiently. And third, we talked about red blood cells, platelets. So naturally the third is too few of the functional mature white blood cells. We know white blood cells help us fight infection. So without them, we are immunocompromised very vulnerable to infection, super easy to get sick. Now, as I said, we're not going into all the ins and outs, but it's important for you to know there are many types of leukemia, okay? It can be acute or chronic, and it's further divided into lymphoid or myeloid. And that depends on which cell line, the lymphoid or the myeloid cell line, is affected. Acute leukemias, like from our practice question, we had someone with ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And then the other acute is AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. Because they're acute, you can tell they progress quickly. ALL is the most common childhood cancer, especially ages two to five, uh, we see ALL. It does have a really high survival rate with treatment, which is fabulous. AML tends to occur more so in adults, and it does have a poorer prognosis. Now, the chronic leukemias, on the other hand, so we have CLL, chronic lymphocytic, and CML, chronic myelogenous, 
they progress more slowly, okay? Acute, chronic, chronic more slowly. Often we find these guys in adults over 50. So that's kind of the, the overview of the buckets, but your general takeaway for the sake of this episode, leukemia, cancer of the blood, our bone marrow releases immature white cells. Those are called blasts, and the blasts really just elbow out all of the other good cells. So because they don't have enough good white cells, really at risk for infections, because they don't have enough red cells, anemia, that's going to lead to the fatigue and pallor that are really common clinical signs. Because they don't have enough platelets, they can't clot well. So bruising and bleeding, those are going to be common signs. And hopefully that kind of makes sense why when you think of where it's coming from. Now, in my time as a pediatric nurse, I unfortunately did see a lot of kiddos come in with leukemia. As we said, the acute leukemia is more common in childhood, so that is what I have seen more of in my career. And the one case that sticks out to me the most was actually an ED that got transferred up. It was a seven-year-old boy, and he came in. They initially went to their primary care, and primary care transferred him over to the ED, actually, because he was presenting with really significant fatigue. If you know seven-year-olds, they are not usually tired. He had bruises all over his body, and his parents were freaking out about it. They were like, I swear, like... He, he's not even tripping and falling or getting hurt a lot. Like these bruises are showing up for no reason. Um, and then the kicker, he looked really pale as well, by the way. But the kicker was he had had a low grade fever for like three weeks and it was not responding to ibuprofen or Tylenol. So between just like totally not acting like himself, being sleepy, not wanting to eat, looking really pale, running that fever for so long. The pediatrician went ahead and referred him over because that's just a very suspicious picture. And he wanted him to have blood work and results that day. He didn't want to send him to an outpatient lab. And we're really glad that he did that. Because when I looked at this kiddo when he came in, the first thing I actually noticed was he was really sweaty. He was sweaty. He was pale. He looked like he was even working hard to breathe. Like everything just took a lot of effort. You could tell he was worn out. And circle back, think back to the anatomy here. His bone marrow, that factory that should be making all his blood cells, we are soon to find out not working. So he's not making those healthy red cells. That's why he's anemic, he's fatigued, and he's looking really pale. He's not making enough of those white cells, so he's prone to infection. That's why he's got this low-grade fever going on. He's not making enough of those platelets. That's why he's bruising, okay? And don't forget, it's all thanks to or because of these immature blasts. They get released too soon. They crowd out all the space and resources so we can't have the good cells. That really explains all of the symptoms. One thing that this kiddo didn't have that I think is important to call out, though, is bone pain, especially at night. Kids will say, oh, my gosh, my legs, my bones inside of me hurts. And that's because the bone marrow, the inside of the bone there, it's overcrowded. It's literally swollen with these cancer cells, the blasts. So that's another kind of thing to be on the lookout for as the cancer progresses. So everyone in the room knows what we're afraid of. All these signs are making sense. The pediatrician called and gave us a head up. So our job next is we need to do the testing. We need to see what's going on. And the first thing is going to be a CBC, complete blood count, with a differential, which means we're going to see all the different types of white blood cells going on in there. So when that test came back, his hemoglobin and hematocrit, very low, low amount of red blood cells. Platelets, very, very low. That's thrombocytopenia. The actual white blood cell count, sky high. Tons of white blood cells. But remember, we got a differential so we can see all the different types of white blood cells. And almost all of them were blasts, that immature cell, the cancer cell. So all his good neutrophils, basophils, lymphocytes, they're getting all crowded out, so they can't help us. We're just seeing lots of blasts. Okay, the next thing, 
we got to get a blood culture going ASAP because this kiddo has a fever and, you know, we don't have leukemia diagnosed yet, but our spidey senses are tingling and a fever in a client with any sort of disease that is making them immunocompromised could be a life-threatening emergency. So as soon as we're drawing blood, boom, we are sending out that sample for a blood culture. Now, what we have to do to confirm the diagnosis of leukemia and figure out what type of leukemia it is, is a bone marrow biopsy. That is painful and takes some planning. But based on our suspicion and his clinical assessment, we did go ahead and start some fluids to support his perfusion get some acetaminophen on board for that fever. And right after I drew those cultures, I started a broad spectrum antibiotic. We knew that fever could escalate in a matter of hours and become life-threatening. So we were not waiting. We were gonna go ahead and empirically start those antibiotics. That bought us some time to go ahead and get him admitted and get that bone marrow biopsy. Now, in the meantime, and going forward in general, nursing interventions are going to be all about protecting this kiddo and conserving whatever function we do already have from his blood system. So first thing, let's help out those white cells by not giving them anything they have to fight against. Neutropenic precautions. He is immunocompromised. The only white cells he got in there are the blasts that are real immature. So we don't want to give his body any germs that it has to fight off. That means strict hand hygiene, no fresh flowers, no raw fruits. We got to be in a private room. We are really going to limit visitors. If you even have an inkling of a runny nose, you're not getting past me. You're not going in that room. All right. Secondly, let's protect his little platelets because he doesn't have enough of those. So he's at risk for bleeding. We're going to monitor closely for bleeding. Keep an eye on all those bruises. Even just a nosebleed could be dangerous because it's hard for him to clot. So he is a fall risk automatically because he is a bleeding risk. And those precautions are going to last a while. It took about 24 hours for the team to go and get that bone marrow biopsy and then a little while longer for those results to come back. But they did confirm ALL, so that's the acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which remember is a very common childhood cancer, most common ages two to five, but it does have a really good response to treatment. So that is a bit of really good news. And it tells us what we need to do. The oncology team can then go start chemotherapy. You as the nurse are going to keep watching those labs, the white blood cell count, the hemoglobin, the platelets. We're going to watch how he responds to everything. We're going to give transfusions of any of these blood products when the counts drop too low. We can kind of do a little top off, you like to think of it. If that hemoglobin goes below seven, let's give him some red blood cells so that we can boost that up. That'll help with the fatigue and the pallor. If that platelet count drops too low, let's top them up. Let's give them a little bit more so we're not so worried about that bleeding risk, okay? So we give them a little extra while he's getting through that chemotherapy and monitor those labs. Lots of labs, lots of blood products. And a good bit of this is going to happen inpatient. Luckily for this kiddo, he was able to go ahead and go home after about a week, and he did have to come back into the outpatient chemo clinic regularly uh, to continue getting that therapy until he was eventually discharged. And I'll just drop one more thing here. As the nurse, that discharge education, super important for an oncology client. Thinking about how we're preventing that infection at home, regularly checking his temperature, saying, you know, hey, if that gets above 100.4, that's actually an emergency. You need to go ahead and come in because we're going to start antibiotics. A fever is never okay in a client that's immunocompromised. Giving them those early warning signs of, you know, hey, if he starts breathing heavy, if his color starts to change, he's looking more and more pale, becoming more and more fatigued. You know, if these signs are going the other way, we want him to come in and be seen. We're going to follow him very closely with this care team and hopefully keep him mostly outpatient. But the big key takeaway when you're thinking about leukemia, no matter what type it is, is to think about the three types of blood cells, red, white, and platelets, what they do for the body, 
And what will the body look like if it doesn't have enough of them? Because that's what's going on in leukemia. We've got immature cells, they crowd out the good ones, and that's what causes all our symptoms. So with that being said, let's circle it back to our practice question and see now if you can get to the right answer and understand why. So the nurse is assessing vital signs for a client diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's ALL. The client's temperature is 101.6 Fahrenheit. That is equivalent to 38.7 Celsius. The nurse should prioritize A, reviewing the client's most recent hemoglobin and hematocrit. B, performing a tepid sponge bath. C, initiating a peripheral vascular access device or D, assessing the client for bruising. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, none of these answers are wrong. Doing any of these things are acceptable actions, but our question is the nurse should prioritize blank. So look back in the stem, we've got a fever. Is a fever in a client with cancer ever okay? No, no it sure isn't. There could be a life-threatening infection. So what are we prioritizing? What action makes sense? It's C, getting a vascular access device because we need cultures and antibiotics. Those are the two things that have to happen pronto. And to do that, we need access, okay? So this is a great example of making sure you critically think through what a client needs and why and what we need to do to get there. Because I know I was skimming this question, I'm looking for antibiotics, antibiotics on there, and it's not there. But what does my client need to be able to get those antibiotics? An IV, that's why C is correct. A sponge bath, I mean, that might feel nice. Assess them for bruising, yeah, you should assess them. Look at their H and H, sure, I bet it's low. None of that helps with the fever. None of that addresses the life-threatening infection. So that's your, your really big takeaway. When it comes to cancer, a fever is never normal. Treat it like it could be life-threatening. Get that access, get cultures, and start your antibiotics. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.